part three tales of english minsters hereford by elizabeth grierson this librivox recording is in the public domain part three now that we have learned about its history let us enter the cathedral and look what it is like inside as you see it is built of red stone in the form of a cross the choir being separated from the nave by a curious screen which is made of four metals iron copper brass and bronze the nave is very grand and stately with rows of massive norman pillars and beautiful carved arches although st ethelbert's shrine no longer exists if we go into the choir we can see the place where it stood here in this arch between the two pillars nearest the altar on our right hand side as we face it a statue of the murdered king has been placed as you see on a pedestal close to one of the pillars and here on the floor in front of the altar is a circular slab of marble on which is traced a representation of his murder but if we cannot visit st ethelbert's shrine we can visit another which is six hundred years old and which was erected to hold the bones of a very celebrated bishop of hereford who was such a good man that after his death people thought he deserved the name of saint thomas de cantaloupe it stands in the north transept and is just a great marble chest with what looks like another open-work chest also of marble above it round the sides of the lower chest a great many figures are carved and if we look at them closely we shall see that they are figures of knights templars with their cloaks and crosses for bishop de cantaloupe was grand master of that order perhaps he obtained this office because he was very fond of soldiers and when he was a little boy he wanted to become one this was a very natural wish for he was the son of a powerful baron who had an estate and manor in buckinghamshire and to become a soldier was the common lot of most boys in his position he had an uncle or great-uncle however who was bishop of worcester and this prelate had other hopes for his nephew's career one day when little thomas was staying with him he asked the child what he would like to be a soldier said the boy promptly looking up at the bishop's face the old man patted him gently on the head then sweetheart thou shalt be a soldier but a soldier of the king of kings he replied and thou shalt fight under the banner of thy namesake st thomas of canterbury and thy harness shall be the cassock of a priest so the little fellow put the idea of earthly warfare out of his head and set himself to study greek and latin instead and when he was older he went to oxford and then to paris with his brother hugh and soon became a very distinguished student when he returned to england he became chancellor of the university of oxford and a very good chancellor he was for he knew how to rule the students who were often very high-spirited and turbulent just as students are nowadays but their high spirits took rougher and more dangerous forms just as the times were rougher and more dangerous for they used to fight with one another with swords and bows and arrows and the chancellor used to get hold of these weapons and confiscate them until such time as their owners came to beg them back on condition that they kept the peace afterwards king henry the third gave him a more important position that of chancellor of england for you must remember that in those days the clergy were politicians as well as priests and often held the highest offices of state then in twelve seventy five when he was quite an elderly man he became bishop of hereford and a true father in god he proved himself to be to the poor people at least for he had one or two very serious and rather funny quarrels with the rich and powerful nobles who lived in his diocese these quarrels arose not because he was jealous of his own dignity but because he was jealous of the dignity of the church and he imagined that any slight or insult paid to him as bishop was really a slight and insult paid to the church of god in fact he must have been rather a puzzle to the rich people over whom he was set to rule in spiritual matters for some of his views were so different from theirs they saw that he was haughty and imperious to any one no matter how great he might be 
who disobeyed him or encroached on his dignity and they saw also that he was always splendidly dressed like a king indeed for he wore a tunic trimmed with royal miniver and had a miniver covering to his bed but they did not understand that under his haughtiness and imperiousness which certainly were faults and under the apparent luxuriousness of his dress lay a very real desire not for his own honour and glory but for the honour and glory of the king of kings whose ambassador he felt himself to be sometimes they caught a glimpse of his real self and were more puzzled still for when they were dining with him they would see him deliberately pass dish after dish which they knew he was very fond of and content himself with the plainest and poorest fare in order that he might learn to say no to his own wishes then when the meal was ended he would rise and select some dainty from the table and carry it out of the hall with his own hands and if he had been followed he would have been found beside the bed of some poor sick servant coaxing him to eat what he had brought to him they knew also that he ordered bales and bales of woolen stuff to give to the poor in winter with which to make stout cloaks and petticoats and that he examined the goods most carefully when they arrived to see that the colours were nice and bright and just what he wanted them to be once as was as wont he was going to visit a poor sick person in a miserable hovel in the town when a high-born baron met him and remonstrated with him telling him that such work was beneath his dignity and that he should leave it to the common clergy sire replied bishop thomas gravely i have to give an account to god for the souls of the poor as well as the rich and the baron had no answer to make there is just one other story which i will tell you about him and this shows his haughty and imperious side the castle at ledbury belonged to him as bishop so did the right of hunting over the malvern hills which were church lands it is quite possible that he did not care in the least for hunting himself and that he would have granted the privilege to any one who had come and asked him for it but when one day he was riding with his attendants on the same malvern hills and heard the sound of a hunting horn and on asking what it meant was told that gilbert de clare earl of gloucester who was at that time the most powerful noble in england also claimed the right of hunting there and was out that day with his hounds his anger rose and he rode forward alone to meet the earl and order him off the ground the earl looked at him contemptuously and answering with a sneer that he was not going to be driven off his ancestral land by a clergyaster and that he had a good mind to chastise him for his impertinence rode on not a word spoke the bishop he simply turned his horse's head and galloped back to his attendants a few hours later the earl and his followers tired out with the chase had dismounted and were resting under the shade of a wide-spreading oak when the trampling of hoofs was heard looking up they saw an extraordinary procession a procession which was generally only to be seen in a church there was the bishop in the foreground vested in mitre cope and stole and there behind him rode his attendant priests and acolytes carrying lighted candles and a great bell and a book and while the earl stared at them half in anger half in fear the book was opened the candles extinguished the bell tolled and the most solemn curses of the church levelled at his head and a form of excommunication read whereby he was denied all the rites of his religion even christian burial itself and all this because he had hunted the wild deer on the malvern hills in defiance of bishop de cantaloupe which in bishop de cantaloupe's eyes meant in defiance of almighty god it was not only with the english barons that the bishop had differences he had them with the pope himself when he thought that the rights of the church of england were being tampered with and it was when he was returning from rome after having been to the pope about one of those differences that he died in italy on august twenty five twelve eighty two his desire was that his bones should be laid to rest in his own cathedral church in far-away england 
so as it was an almost impossible task to convey a dead body across europe in those days do you know what his followers did they boiled his body until the flesh separated from the bones then they buried the flesh in the church of st severus near florence and the bones which were now quite easy to carry they brought to hereford and buried them in the lady chapel they were afterwards removed to a little chapel known as the chapel of st catherine and at last this beautiful shrine was prepared for them and they were placed inside not very far from the shrine of thomas de cantaloupe on the east wall of the transept there are two tablets one above the other which i think you would like to look at for they tell a very curious and pathetic story as you see they have both been placed there in memory of the same man captain arkwright but not at the same time for if you read the inscriptions you will see that one of them is thirty-one years older than the other captain arkwright was a young soldier who was very fond of alpine climbing and on october thirteenth eighteen sixty six he set out to try to ascend mont blanc he never returned for he was caught in an avalanche and swept away out of sight although careful search was made his body could not be found and after a time all hope of ever finding it was given up and this topmost tablet was erected to his memory thirty-one years passed by and those of his friends who were alive had become elderly men and women and i suppose his memory had grown a little dim to them when strange news came from the little village of chamonix which lies at the foot of the great white mountain you all know what a glacier is a river of ice which moves very very slowly down the side of a snow mountain but which comes at last to the region where the air is so warm that it melts and runs away down the valley in a torrent of muddy water well captain arkwright's body had been swept by the avalanche into a deep crevasse or crack in one of these glaciers and all these years it had been moving encased in ice slowly down the mountain until on august twenty three eighteen ninety seven it appeared at the foot of the glacier near chamonix in a perfect state of preservation just as it was on the day when he was killed it was taken from the ice which had held it so long and so mysteriously and laid in chamonix churchyard and one of arkwright's old schoolfellows who by this time had become dean of this cathedral had the second or lower tablet erected as a memorial of the strange event now let us cross the church and go into the south transept to look at a curious raised tomb which stands there which i am sure all the little boys and girls at least would like to look at as you see three figures rest upon it a father a mother and a tiny little baby who lies half hidden among the draperies of her mother's gown if you look at the baby's forehead you can trace the letters of her name anne and this tells you that the tomb is what is known as a chrysome that is it is the burial place of a little child who died within a month of its baptism and who was buried in its baptismal robe as a rule in such a case a cross is marked on the baby's brow but this child is marked with its name instead the girl mother for she was only eighteen who died when her baby was born and was buried along with her was the wife of a knight named sir alexander denton who was so broken-hearted at his loss that he made up his mind that he would never marry again and that when he died he also would be buried there but in later years he married another lady and after all was buried in a church in buckinghamshire though as you see his effigy has been placed here to make the family group complete there are three very ancient things belonging to this cathedral at which we must look before we leave it a very old map which hangs in that wooden case on the wall quite close to the chrysum tomb a very old chair which stands on the north side of the altar and a very old manuscript which we can see in the library let us look at the map first at one time it was believed to be the oldest map in the world and although an older one has been discovered in germany the two must have been made about the same time for they closely resemble each other 
as you may think it is very precious so precious that during the time of the civil war it was hidden under the floor of a little chantry on the other side of the church and was only discovered some hundred and fifty years ago if we examine it we shall see what the people who lived in the year thirteen hundred or thereabouts imagined the world to be like to begin with they made the top of the map east and the bottom west so their ideas of direction were different from ours the world is round surrounded by the sea and at the top of it lies the garden of eden with rivers running out of it in the centre is jerusalem and all round that city are representations of old testament events the flood and the ark the red sea and the journey of the children of israel lot's wife etc great britain is marked on the map with the names of very few towns but most of the cathedrals are noted while the other countries of europe are also shown with the animals which were supposed to live there and it is very curious to notice how monkeys were believed to live in norway and serpents in germany we must not spend too much time here however for we have still to see the old chair and the old book the chair is in the sanctuary on the north side of the altar it stands here because it was used as the bishop's chair for it is so plain we can hardly call it a throne until the present throne which stands near the choir stalls was erected we do not know when it was made or how many bishops have sat in it but it must be at least nearly eight hundred years old for we know that the wicked king stephen visiting hereford after its bishop had been forced to fly and in his pride and arrogance dared to sit in his place during service wearing his royal crown now let us go out by this door in the south wall of the nave and pass along what is known as the bishop's cloister until we come to the library which is built on the side of the old west cloister the building is new but the books it contains are very ancient and valuable for this is a chained library that is most of the books are fastened by chains to a rod which is placed above the shelf on which they stand so that any one can take them down and lay them on the broad desk-like shelf which finds a place below the bookshelves and read them there but they cannot be taken away here is the very ancient book which i have mentioned it is a copy of the gospels written in anglo-saxon characters and it must be at least a thousand years old but old as it is there are many other books bound in boards of thin oak covered with sheepskin which are quite as interesting here are two prayer books for example one of which lets us see the order of service used in hereford in twelve sixty five the other that which was used at bangor in wales in fourteen hundred they are quite different and as you look at them the librarian will tell you that one is hereford use and the other banger use for you must understand that long ago the service in church was not the same all over england as it is to-day one form of service was used in one cathedral and in all the surrounding district another a little different was used in another and so on in this way there was a roman use which was the same as that used in rome a serum use which was the most common and was the same as that used at salisbury a hereford use a lincoln use a york use and a banger use let us take down this enormous volume and see what it contains the whole of the books of genesis and exodus with beautifully printed notes and spaces for other notes which have never been put in look how straight and neat and symmetrical the columns of printing are and the spaces between them how did the monks manage this do you think see these tiny punctures in the vellum like tiny pin pricks they tell us they used a little wheel with tiny spikes in the rim to space their columns here is an ancient book of devotion to whom did it belong open it and you will find out for h latimer is written inside he who died for his belief at worcester here is the nuremberg chronicle a famous book in bygone days for it was almost the only picture book that children had 
and it contains two thousand quaint woodcuts showing the progress of the world from the creation down to the time it was written here is a breeches bible which gets its name from the fact that the printer has printed that adam and eve made themselves breeches instead of aprons and near it is a cider bible which was printed by a man named nicholas de hereford who was so accustomed to the beverage used in his native county that he translated the verse in judges which tells us that samson's mother was to drink no strong drink by drink no cider here we see william the conqueror's seal and here is that of oliver cromwell indeed there are so many interesting and curious things to be seen in the chained library at hereford that a book could be written about them alone end of part three end of tales of english minsters hereford by elizabeth grierson